Our Father who art in heaven, thou art the true and living God of Israel in whom we trust. Dear Father, we come before your presence here at this evening hour as we come together around your word of truth and uh, particularly the, the apocalypse that we've been engaged in for some time now. We pray that you will help us to rightly discern and divide your word of truth as we attempt to gain a better understanding of the, the apocalypse apocalyptic message as it uh, develops through time and and uh, reveals unto us where we are in the time frame of your your uh, plan and purpose for the earth we know father that we are living in the end of the sixth file period before the coming of your son and we pray that each of us might take these words and uh, apply them to our lives and help us to be aware of the fact that we are near the return of your son and make ourselves ready and watching for that wonderful event. We pray that time might be soon. Forgive us of our sins, Father, now as we call upon you and give you our thanksgiving and all our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, I hope tonight will be a very interesting uh, class. It's a very exciting period of time. Uh, we're going to uh, finish up with this first sea beast. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but then we're going to also go into the beast of the earth and the contrast of them and the time period and how it unfolded. And history is just is very clear on what we're looking at here um, of the things we're going to uh, discuss tonight. And it's just a, a, a very interesting period of time, although it covered many centuries. All right, so last week um, we uh, got into this as the sea beast came out of the out of the uh, sea. Um, the dragon, it says in uh, Revelation 13 too, of course we discussed this all last week, but the dragon gave him his uh, power and his seat and great authority. And uh, we talked about this um, given him his seat, is actually given him a seat in government and power, not, uh, not just a place to sit down and be comfortable, so to speak. Um, so what's happening here, just to remind everyone, here we are seeing a transferring of power and authority to this new entity that is coming on the scene, which is this beast rising out of the sea. And we talked about when did that actually happen? And uh, we talked about how it was under Emperor Justinian, who is now we're about 200 and uh, some years past Constantine. And, and Justinian, as we talked about, decreed that the Bishop of Rome by this stage was known as the Pope, uh, was the head of all the churches. And I would suggest to you that this is telling us that this is when he we gave him his seat, his first real seat of authority to sit in. And he had authority over all the churches. Now, he did not have authority over Justinian or the emperor or anything like that. But he had power over the, the churches and the religious system that was in place. Also, at that time, uh, with Justinian, at the very beginning of his reign, he deemed it proper to declare by law the church's belief in the Trinity and incarnation and to threaten all heretics with the appropriate penalties. Talked about that fourth beast in Daniel, which we're going to look at in some detail tonight about those horns, um, how it had iron and teeth, uh, excuse me, teeth and claws of iron, and it tread underfoot. And I would suggest to you that this is the treading underfoot time that has started because of this. Um, so, and then we, we, to clarify things, we have... Constantinople here, as you see on the map here in the east, which is the military capital right here, and Rome became the religious capital of the, uh, the Roman Empire. But we're in a period here, and we'll talk about it, this is that barbarian period, the 500s, when all those things, we talked about the barbarians coming in and attacking from every angle, the, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Huns, all of that is in this mix and is, even though we're not going to really talk about it that much, it is what is causing the transformation 
of the Roman Empire into another, uh, into multiple um, powers. Um, and we talked about the beast of the sea, it appears to be because we see Rome is sitting right out here in the sea compared to the rest of the nation uh, there. And that's why that is. And we're going to look at the details of this. And during this time, the, during this time, the dragon is given its power to the beast. It's over a period of time, but Justinian made things jump forward uh, uh, a lot under his rule. Um, also, we talk about, of course, this is the dragon is in Constantinople, which is the, the, the pagan dragon, which is now the church is taking on those attributes. And the beast of the sea, the barbarian period is taking place now that we're going to finish up with. And what we're going to get into also tonight is, which comes into play at approximately 800 AD. And we're going to look at that in some detail. And that's about where we left off last week. And we left off with this slide about um, the beast having uh, one of these heads that was wounded. So we're going to start here and pick up. And let's see, um, Joanne, would you read this? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get it on my screen. Revelation 13, 3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay, so this tells us one of these heads gets wounded temporarily, and it was a bad wound, but it's still healed. It said it was a deadly wound, but it's still healed, and then the world wondered at this. Um, so this is telling us there is some moment in time where things go bad for this developing beast system, um, but it recovers. And I think, you know, why this, I'm going to show you the historically what that's referring to, but it, it shows what I, I think is happening is that God is just showing us how he's in control and doing these things. Um, and that's something that's going to get weak. And then it's going to get strong again. It's just, to me, a reinforcing of this and that it was expected to happen in time. And it happened in time. And that's what something we're going to look at here shortly. Now, remember, the heads represent different forms of government, um, just like on the dragon. Remember, there was um, the seven forms of uh, Roman government. Well, the, those characteristics are all carrying over to this beast. Um, <clears throat> So remember, the imperial six head was the beast in John's day. John was under the imperial Rome. But Italy and Rome uh, were overthrown by Odo Acer, king of the Goths, in 476, forming the seventh head of the beast. Um, so a new form of government is, is coming into play. And after about 70 years, Emperor Justinian took back Rome in 455, 544, and the wound was healed. Now, I'm going to show you some things we've already covered, but so that you understand how these, this is overlapping with things we've already talked about. This is where the beast is a story that is happening and forming, but we already went and looked at something else that was happening and forming, but they're running parallel with each other. And remember, Odiacer, he was the first barbarian to sit on a, uh, a throne of Rome in the West. But, and he became sort of like, I, I guess the word I think I came up with before, sort of like a viceroy. In other words, he didn't just change everything over through the government, threw it out the door. He agreed to keep Roman ways going and their laws and things of that nature. But the point was, he was not a Roman. He was a barbarian. So was Odo Acer a German or what was he? I'm really not sure. Okay. Where, do you know where that statue is? No, I don't. Um, just type him in on Wikipedia. I, I, I don't remember. 
He, he, probably, he could have been dramatic. He looks like Adam from Seven Brides and Seven Brothers. Was, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he does. Was it like Hungarian? Well, that's what I was wondering. Was a part, I, he had to be part of the Austrian Hungarian Empire, but was he a Visigoth, a Goth, or. Uh, he was one of the Goths. That's, uh, there were two Goths. I, I'd have to go back and look at my Goth. slides again to remember those details. Okay. I'm just curious because it's really amazing that he decided to keep the Roman traditions. Right. And in the meantime, now some of y'all, if you haven't been here before, we, we went over this whole barbarian takeover and everything. And the other history that's unfolding here also is that Theodoric the Great, uh, he's an Ostrogoth. He was an Ostrogoth. He, um, he attacked Theodoric under the um, ad advice of, of Rome because Oda Acer started getting out of hand and he was getting hard to uh, control in the things that he was doing. So uh, Rome sort of like uh, hired him as a vigilante with his own army of, of barbarians to go over there and he made war with Oda Acer. And the two of them agreed to make peace. But what happened was, um, uh, they had some get together at some function where they were going to talk about peace and uh, Theodoric rose up and, and ran him through and killed him and took over. It. What's that? I guess he got tired of talking about it. Well, he, he decided that I'm going to sit on the throne. So it was this, was this Theodoric or? Theodoric. Yeah, he killed Odeacer. He was hired by Eastern Rome an emperor to go over there and get that guy straight or do something with him. He went in there, overthrew him, agreed to work with him, and then killed him. Um, what a good peace talk. Well, this is the 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 wounding of that head because uh, an emperor, a Roman emperor, is not sitting on it. Here you have barbarians ruling the Western Empire, so to speak. But anyway, that's the history that we covered before. But what is this wound? This was the wound that, that took place. And uh, this is like the start of the Middle Ages, so to speak. And you see by the dates there that Justinian comes right after this, right after Theodoric um, is gone. <clears throat> so, um, so, but here we also, we have a seven headed beast, but another head is yet to come. And we're gonna, we gotta, uh, jump ahead uh, back into Revelation 17 again. We've been going there a lot. Um, let's see. Um, Fonda, can you read this? This is Revelation 17 now. We've, we've left cool. chapter 13 and we've moved forward to 17 to look at this. So. Okay, Revelation 17, 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. It sounds like a real riddle, doesn't it? What was that all? He's he's yeah. the eight, and he's of the seven, and he goes into perdition. So we have eight, seven, and perdition. Um, so there is an eighth head that is coming, but it is of the seven. In other words, you're not going to see an actual head on the beast, um, but it's as powerful as one of the other heads are. And it goes into perdition. And the word perdition, if you look it up, it has to do with spiritual ruin. In other words, it's a religious system that's going to, um, at, at some point, it's going to uh, fall. Um, and it fits very well with the papal system. It is a, let's, uh, this is the best way I knew how to say it. Maybe Gerald can... <laughs> Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it is a government within a government, so to speak, like the Holy Roman Empire dwelt inside the existing nations. Um, the Holy Roman Empire controlled a lot of area, but it actually was not their king, but he had absolute authority over those countries is, uh, religiously, if, if you understand what I'm saying. So it's it has the equivalence of an eighth but is of the seventh, and it, its end is going to be spiritual ruin, if that makes any sense to you. So I would suggest to you it is the, the, uh, the strength of, because remember the beast 
all those heads represent the different form of governments and the horns are the nations that come up, but there's a spiritual government working within it that has great power that's coming. So uh, if, if that makes sense to you. I, it, it took me a long time just to get my head wrapped around that. Um, let's see, uh, Fonda, would you also read this? This is the same chapter. Remember, we're still in Revelation 17 because we get okay. clarity about this here. Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, Christ, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Okay, so they're making war with the Lamb. Christ must be in the earth. This is something that's looking forward to the kingdom age. This thing is ultimately going to make war with the Lamb. And that is when it will come into perdition or spiritual ruin. Um, so the reason I jumped ahead is because we get this other head thing and this wound and all of these things that are happening. And we'll look at it again in some detail when we get to chapter 17. But I felt it's significant to let you know another head is coming and what it involves. So, um, Brother Roger? Yes. Verse 13, what, who do you feel that the, the these is? Is that the papal system? Um, I don't have it right in front. Would you read it? Well, it's just, I'm sorry, it's uh, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and kings of kings, and they hate, <coughs> excuse me, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. My, my question is I'm just asking is who is the these in this verse? I'm the ten kings. The ten kings. Yeah, that's what that's where I was going. It's the okay. Okay. Uh, all these horns and, and things of that nature. Um, thank you, Gerald. That's I, I it took me a few minutes to, to recall it, but uh, it's this whole whole package deal, so to speak. Um, that all that war is going to be there. In other words, if you would were to insert the, the, the wording there in verse 14, it says these, in other words, these 10 kings will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. That's, that's who we look to now in the, Europe, uh, the European common market or the European Union. And it speaks of that in verse 12, where it says, the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Yeah, so <clears throat> those 10 kings uh, at the time of John had not received any their power yet because it was yet future. Uh, but he's, it's a prophecy there of the things to come there and in, in the development of the 10 horns under this, uh, in this beast system that's being described there in chapter 17 about the um, Babylon the Great, you know, and where it's talking about the, uh, well, in verse one, it begins, it says, and one of the seven angels said to me, uh, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters and so on. And so they, uh, when you go on down then to uh, verse seven, where it talks about the beast that carries the harlot woman and which has the seven heads and the 10 horns, there's the 10 horns there on that beast. That is uh, that she is riding upon. So we always think about that as the the Euro beast uh, and the ten kings that will give their power. The ten European nations or kings that will give their power into this beast system, uh, which would be actually ridden, as it were, by the the, the harlot church or the papacy uh, there in Rome. So that's what we're looking at in this final development of the uh, of the beast with the ten kings with the harlot woman riding it that's going to uh, confront or be confronted by the lamb and those who are uh, in concert with him so that's you know it's the final it's the final uh, uh, representation of the beast and it's uh, in the, in the way it's morphed through time so to speak 
that it becomes Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth, where it speaks about it in 17 verse uh, 5 there. It's the final manifestation of the beast power, the Western beast, that is, the beast of the sea that, that you know, came up and developed and uh, in its final manifestation, which we're looking at today as being developed in the, um, in the, in the nations of uh, Europe with the Catholic Church. Have you addressed the one hour with the beast? What's that? Have you addressed the one hour with the beast? Uh, what verse was that? Is it was that in seventeen? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, verse it, twelve. Just to give you, um, let me go back. Hang on. And I jumped to seventeen just for the uh, for the purpose of showing you that there's an eight head because we've been talking yeah. about the wounded head and so on. Um, I don't have my notes right in front of me, so I'm not as sharp on it as I'd like to be to answer that question. Oh well, that's okay. We'll, we will be getting to 17. We're going to take this line by line. So Okay. Uh, All right. We'll get it later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because we're kind of getting distracted from, I, I thought it'd be interesting to, to put this in here, but uh, I didn't want to get, spend the whole night on 17. But um, the, if you don't understand what the horns are and what it's talking about, I guess it, it can be confusing. So anyway, we'll get there in a few weeks. Uh, we're not too far away from that. So, okay, so, um, um, all right, all right, we covered that. Okay, so now let's come on back to our uh, 13th chapter. In 549, Justinian issued a pragmatic sanction giving the Pope control of municipal and pro, pro, providential, how do you say that word? Providential, providential. providential governments. Um, and what that means is a pragmatic sanction, I had to look this up, is a sovereign's solemn decree on a matter of primary importance and has the force of fundamental law. This is what he gave the Pope. I wanted to explain this on as far as a legal thing of what was happening, not so much on the spiritual level, but he made it that what he says has the force of fundamental law. So we can see at this point, this beast has been given another level and a great level of power when you can start forcing the law on from, from yourself uh, as far as what you decree. It's, it's pretty much coming into the, the realm of being a, uh, you know, a, a king, dictator type, type thing. So anyway, I just wanted you to understand historically written in the government books that's what it says um, the papacy seat that he now has is gaining power very powerful um so okay brother um, Roger that that falls in line with what is stated there in uh chapter 13 verse 2 at the end there where it says the dragon gave him his power his throne and great authority which translates to what you've been saying there that the Emperor in the East, which is at this time the Justinian, on the slide there, pragmatic sanction there concerning the, the power of the Pope in the West. In other words, he transferred or gave that power uh, to the Pope uh, as if he were uh, upon a throne, because that word throne there is thronos, and, uh, and gave him great authority there in the West uh, and sanctioned that because he was the sole emperor of the empire. That is Justinian in the East was right. the sole emperor of the empire and, and uh, delegated that authority to the Pope as if he were a, um, a reigning uh, a sovereign, you know, in the West. Right, that's right. Because he's a spiritual sovereign, I guess, at this time. So he has control of the churches. That's now so, within his grip. <laughs> Roger and Gerald does, Go back one more. The, the programmatic thing, does it allow them to collect taxes? Um, that might be added into it if the Pope decrees it, I guess. I don't know. This is just saying that the Pope had the power that what he says has the force of fundamental law. Now, he probably said a lot of things, but I don't know about taxes. Yeah, I'm just curious about how they, how they turn this into money. Yeah. 
I'm sure they, they made it up as they went along, whatever worked and got the money coming in. So, okay. They sold, they sold indulgences. Yes, they did. Later yeah. on, but that's that how got wet, rich. Mm -hmm. So a giant Catholic gift shop. <laughs> well, you go, you go and you have your sins forgiven if you pay enough. Yeah, that's true. Or you get somebody out of purgatory uh, and think family out of purgatory and think, or you shorten their time in purgatory. I was reading that uh, this past week. Some of the indulgences of this 95 thesis that uh, got mailed to the door of the church. One of them was paying money to get your family or family member a, a shorter sentence than purgatory <laughs> on the way to heaven, I guess. So, and of course, people fell into it and paid millions of dollars into it through the centuries. Okay. okay. Um, all right, let's see who has, um, what else we got here? Uh, Helen, could you read this? Revelation 13, four, and they, that is all the world, worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the, um, here's another level. Here's another layer. First, he was given um, um, the power to make law by what he said. Now we have the word worship uh, tied to him. And, and then these things that here we, and we see that today, you know, people kiss the Pope's hand and things like that uh, and, and fall and kiss his feet and, and things of that nature. So we we keep seeing these layers of power being added and uh, uh, to him, which of course gives him more and more of a grip on all the people who believe it's true. Because keep in mind, a lot of people were still probably believing that the kingdom of God had come. Remember that back at, at, in uh, Constantine's time, there were those who th thought the king, this is the kingdom of God. So whatever, you know, the vicar of Christ says, it must be so. All right. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, the, this phrase that is pretty much they're thinking, who can overthrow the kingdom of God? Is what this verse I think is implying. It's the way people were. This this is how it's interpreted. Really, huh? How it was interpreted. Yeah, how it was interpreted. Yeah. So that this is the kind of thing that nothing can. It's just like people also thought who could overthrow Rome, you know and things of that nature. So, oh, anyway, if that's the mindset now. The dragon now is given the beast power to usher in the seeds of the Holy Roman Empire. Brother Roger? Yes. Just to get the uh, thrust of that word, their uh, worship, to know what, you know, how it relates to the situation there and elevating the Pope in the West to someone to be worshiped as well as the the emperor in the east of course he would be worshiped by the populace but uh that word uh worship there is from the greek uh proskuneo and it uh it says it probably is a derivative of another word and says meaning to kiss to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand oh my or to fawn or to crouch to that is literally or figuratively prostrate, one, prostrate oneself in homage uh, to someone, to reverence or to adore. That's what the, the, the word means there. So you can see what kind of status the, the, if the Pope in the West had uh, gained by the uh, authority of this emperor in the East that... Um, made it to one that would be adored and reverenced and uh and paid homage to and uh in the sense of uh, like a like a dog licking his master's hand you know when you think what what does the pope have on his on his finger that people want to walk up and uh and kiss you know it's it's that same thing that they worship or adore or revere him as uh as a sovereign or you know a, 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 a imperial sovereign or a religious sovereign for that matter whichever capacity it might be. Well, that's good, Drew. I never looked the word up, but <laughs> it's amazing how that fits, um, what's coming. 
what or what gained and what is still now. All right, so um, I would suggest to you that the, uh, this beast is not the Holy Roman Empire, but it is the seeds of the Holy Roman Empire. This is the development of the system that will turn into the Holy Roman Empire over the next 300 years. And that's what we're going to be looking at here uh, tonight as we get into it. So this thing has come up, it's developed, it's been given power, it's got, uh, the governments have gone through some hard times with the barbarians, but the barbarians were uh, uh, taken care of. Uh, Justinian and things like that. So we see this whole history that has gone through and these nations are starting to form. Um, and that's what we're gonna see when, by the time we get to the beast of the earth, which is coming up here shortly. This is an, I wanted to say, they, this is an exciting piece of history. And um, I kind of just added this thought into this because the longer I work on this, the more I, I realize the value of history that I never put any value on when I was growing up, because most of my life, I was never interested in this type of history of the, the barbarians and European development and these nations. But now understanding how, how this was all leading to the final showdown with Christ and the saints. I have a personal connection to it. And I hope we all maybe are, are getting that, that we should have some kind of connection to this happening because if we are with Christ, we are going to deal with this system and, and its final phase. And we're reading about how it came in and how it um, grew and the horrible thing, things that it's done. And we should be connected. And again, uh, the revelation was given to us as, as Jesus is closing thoughts to us. Uh, nothing else is recorded from him except this. Um, this, this book. So revelation should be to me, Revelation should be precious to us all, not a book to be, I don't ever get that, or, you know, it's a little deep for me or something. He wrote it down for his servants. And this is the, the wonderful jewels that we're finding out about what was happening in history. So anyway, I just wanted to say that because it's become that to me. Okay, so in Constantinople, we have the drag. And what's coming here is uh, the rise of this beast. Um, let's see who's next. Uh, David, can you read this? Revelation 13, 5. And there was given unto him, sea beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 in two months. Okay, so we have the 40 and two months. Again, that's a 1260 year period um, that we talked about in the past. And the sea beast was becoming powerful enough to even perhaps start wars if necessary because he had that authority. So David, read this next one also since you're reading. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Okay, now, it sounds like, you know, we would think somebody who opened his mouth and blasphemy, it's like the cursing God and things like that. The blasphemy is in the things that they are teaching and, and embracing with paganism that is, is becoming blasphemy against God. And we... Um, and we're going to see how this speaking blasphemy is a key identification of this beast, um, especially when we get into chapter 17. It comes up again, and, and in Daniel it came up. The paganistic teachings became law, and you were a heretic for not believing them. This is the blasphemy that is, is happening here, and there are things that are opposed to God. Um, just, just for an example, to teach to teach that you could pray to Mary, the mother of God, is blasphemy. Scripture tells us that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So to say and teach that you can pray to Mary and she will hear you and intercede for you is a form of blasphemy. And it is against God's teachings. It is against the things that he wrote. 
but they have twist, they're twisting the scriptures and things of that through it slowly. Now these teachings developed slowly, very slowly through the, through the centuries. It wasn't something that said, well, we're just gonna change this and we're gonna say that Mary's this and so on. It happened over hundreds of years. Keep that in mind, how long all of this is taking. And it was a domino effect. So once you made Jesus God, then Mary became a God herself. Right. And she got worshipped. And by extension, anybody who was a saint of any kind became another idol right. that they could pray to. So it just kept expanding right. this world of false truths. Right. And the, the tabernacle part, that was the, the big, big key signature moment. He hired the most prominent architect in the world at that time, Bernini, to design St. Peter's and the arms. They're supposed to be gathering in all the nations. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the high form of architecture that is still the model for everything today. Every state capital is modeled after Bernini's uh, St. Peter's. The Washington Capitol is designed after Bernini's. Everybody, St. Paul's Cathedral, right back to that building. Who was Bernini? Bernini was the architect who designed for the Pope everything that we have of St. Peter's. Oh, okay. And <clears throat> that was said to be the real tabernacle, the center of it all. Oh, okay. Taking away from the real temple that was in Jerusalem and proclaiming the Pope's citadel mm -hmm. as, and it's its own country. It's, yeah. it's an enclave within Italy. So that's how he replaced the tabernacle. And by calling himself God, he changed the name. Mm -hmm. And those that dwelt in heaven was changed by him making all the saints that are dead into people you can pray to. Mm -hmm. So it just was amazing. Like he literally like Jeroboam son of Nebat, checkmarked every way he could possibly eclipse God mm -hmm. in every way. So it's just, it's really amazing. It is. It's, it's, it's that time where these things are now coming in and they're getting more and more and more. And they were even changing up into the 1800s. They were still uh, new things about, um, I'll get there. I can't remember which one. It was a couple of them about the infallibility of the Pope and things of that nature. But, um, we'll get there in, in probably a couple months. So we'll look at that. Yeah. So Joseph put on a really interesting point there. How the Vatican City is like your eighth bit. Yeah. It is a power within the other powers, but it's not a country right. literally of its own, but all the other nations are willing to give the power to that state. Government within a government. So it's perfectly fine, just right there. Yeah, well, that, that's what a government within a government is called an enclave. Yeah, oh, exactly. enclave is the right term because it's like it's like Luxembourg is yeah. a country within another country. Or um, I'm trying to think of another good example, there aren't many <laughs> besides the Vatican. But this is the one that's withstood the test of time. That that's been ahead for a long time. Okay, so now we need to um, what we we need to look at this fourth beast. Uh, and Dan, we're, we're going back again, Dan, you cannot talk about these things without constantly going back to Daniel, because Daniel saw it in a much rougher sense, but we pick up little things about it that are not written in Revelation. And this is something we're going to look at here, and I found this very fascinating. This fourth beach, which was more diverse than all the others, that monster in the back, that Daniel did not know what kind of an animal it was. And it was more fierce and worse than all the others put together. So we need to look at this fourth beast a little closer for some details that we don't get in Revelations. And all these horns are now starting to rise up. And Daniel saw horns on this beast. We saw them on individual heads, but here we're seeing them on one head. But there's a, a special feature that comes up here. And I found this uh, slide extremely well done. Um, let's, we're going to go here and read this. Uh, Nancy, can you read this? You're going to read about three slides. Here. Okay, Daniel 7, 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, 
which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. In Daniel 7.20, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell. Okay, we'll stop there just for a second. I it didn't even, I had missed this part the other times I've taught it. I was going through there. What if somebody asked me who were the three that fell? I better figure that one out. So we got this horn that came up, um, which came up and before whom three fell. So I, I, I did some research on it and one from Christadelphian and another one from uh, Gibbons talks about it historically, um, is when Pepin, king of the Franks, which is Charlemagne's father, and we're going to be getting into Charlemagne tonight, so this is actually looking forward to 800 AD, um, or just before 800 AD. Uh, Charlemagne's father conquered the three areas which fell in Italy in 758 AD, in what became known and was given to the Pope and became known as the Papal States and gave them to the Pope. Now, there was there were three sections that are named in there. Um, you'd have to just, just go to Wikipedia and see what they are. But if you look at this map up here in the corner of the slide, it's that brown area. And it was three of these little areas in there that became the first uh, land that I would say that the Pope actually ruled over like a king. I would say, if, if I'm putting that right. Um, they, they, were, they were a gift to him. And so they were three smaller little entities that fell before this big one. And this big one is now controlling that area. And you can look at that up and if you, um, where I got this on, the book of Daniel by H.B. Mansfield, the green, his green book on that. And Gibbons in the decline and the fall of the Roman Empire talks about it also about these three small areas that uh, were given to the Pope and became uh, the, uh, the beginning of the papal states, but, and so, which is a significant thing. I never picked up on how significant that little thing uh, before whom three fell. So that's what's happening here. The Pope is now being given land that he is a ruler over, not just churches, but land also. Um, so not only was he a religious sovereign, now he's become a secular ruler. Yes. I think secular he, ruler. He not, he's not beyond religion. religion. Now yeah. he's become a secular uh, sovereign uh, because of being gifted those three states that uh, Pepin had gifted the, the Pope after he had uh, defeated them. But you can see that we're talking, we're 758 AD now. We've moved forward yeah. uh, here. This, this horn is actually talking about 800 AD going forward uh, when Charlemagne comes on, on board here. But it was Charlemagne's father that gave this land to the Pope. So he's given him, he's becoming extremely wealthy. All right, I, Nancy, can you continue reading the next couple of slides here? And of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Okay, I, so, excuse me, I'll, I'll stop you there. I got a little something to say. Um, so there's going to be one horn that is bigger than all the rest, and it speaks louder. And that's this horn. It came up and it was more stout um, than the horn kings, so to speak, or more powerful. And this is the history we are now seeing in Revelations 13. This is, this is Revelations 13 right here. When we look at Daniel, that's the kind of the period we're talking about. Um, uh, is this uh, middle, uh, middle Ages time? All right, continue on there, Nancy. Daniel 721, I beheld in the same horn made with war with the saints and prevailed against them. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High 
and think to change times and laws. Okay, so this horn is going to wear out the saints and is going to think to change times and laws. And remember, he was giving the power to make laws. The horn was something that Daniel didn't fully understand, but knew it would be more powerful than the other horns that had fallen before. But it, and it would be the worst of them, changing laws, scripture, and wearing out those who would not comply. Of course, as we know, many people were burned at the stake and tortured and things of that nature. The sea and the earth be systems is the full fulfillment of this, this horn, of what it does. And I, I put this little inset in there of the picture because what mentions is a bigger picture of this horn in Daniel. But in Daniel, we get a few things to know about these papal states and things like that that you would not pick up in Revelations if it hadn't been written. So you need both books to really cover this subject. Now, if we come back to um, uh, Revelations 13, look at the wording compared to what we just, what Nancy just read in, in uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, Leah, would you read this? And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So here, this beast, this sea beast, is going to make war with the saints. Just like the, the big horn was told that it would wear out the saints and things of that. Notice the saints are a target of this. Uh, the saints of the Most High God. So those would be those people who we would have been in fellowship with. Think about that. This should be also our, our connection where we should uh, embrace this of the brothers and sisters that had lived through this era of time. Uh, it's always, it's since I put this class together, I never thought about, I just thought about Christians being persecuted and all. But the saints are the, our brothers and sisters in Christ who will be in the kingdom. And they had to live through this period of time. And, and none of us would have wanted to, but they, they had to. And, it's just they, something to consider. They were persecuted horribly. That's yeah. why Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you can get that online as a PDF and read it all. And it covers how all the saints died, sorry, how all the, the disciples died. Mm -hmm. And then it goes, plunges all the way through history of how many people the Catholic Church killed and how they died. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This talks about it in a very vague sense, and the right. other one gives you all the particulars right. of what actually happened. All right. Um, okay, moving forward. Um, let's see. Uh, Linda, can you read this? Revelation 13 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall, shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world okay so here we have <laughs> we can see this but look who's who worships them those whose names written in the book of life i didn't even pick that up until this past time i worked on this to give this class not written in the book of life if you are a part of this system you better separate yourself from it for you will not be in the kingdom. This is very clear that you will not be in God's kingdom if you align yourself in any way with this system because you are not in the book of life. It's very clear. This is also why there should be a, an intolerance for any of the teachings of this system to be found among us. I think that's very clear here. Uh, uh, of our, if, if you're not sure what those differences are, you need to look in it. We live in such a world of tolerance, but as we can see, tolerance of these thing teachings is intolerance to God, and it will it can be assured here that it does not it does matter what you believe. There's only one gospel, and this is not that gospel. This is the false gospel that has developed through the centuries, through, with the on the on the uh, back of paganism. So. It looks like we ran this one to the end.
I was hoping to get into the other bees. Brother uh, Roger. Yes. Uh, it, it may be important also to uh, correlate the time frame in which this uh, this beast was going to wear out the saints and persecute the saints. In the Revelation uh, 13, it says that uh, in 5, it says he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So if you go back to Daniel, it correlates with what Daniel uh, speaks to uh, about this beast as well there if we went on if we finished up verse 25 of Daniel 7 Daniel his prophecy as well identifies the time frame in which the uh, this uh, this one that was uh, making war with the saints back in work, verse 21 of Daniel 7 I was watching in the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them and uh, then it goes down to 25, which you read part of that, and it says, uh, then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half time, or 1260 years, which equates to the 42 months there, Revelation 13 and verse 5. So it's the same time period, it's the same entity that is, uh, is, is bringing on the persecution of the saints and making war with them that we're speaking about here in, in the time in which we're uh, uh, seeing this beast of the sea uh, come into power and its, and its power and authority being given to, the, to it from the uh, dragon power in the east. Oh, thanks. 42 months. And so when you think about those, those time periods of Justinian who uh, you know, gave, made the Bishop of Rome uh, the head of all bishops in 533, uh, 529 to 533 that you know it's not a definite uh, time but add 1260 to that you you're getting up to the time of the uh of the uh two witnesses you know when when the um in seven in uh five 533 to in 1260 that's the french revolution it's bringing right. to the time of the french revolution right right that's when Napoleon made a short little French sandwich out of the Pope. Yeah. And also, if you, the okay. other time frame of, uh, if you take the uh, decree of Emperor Focus there in, in, uh, in Constantinople in, in 610, his decree concerning uh, the papacy, and add 1262, it should come to 1870 when the temporal power of the Pope was uh, taken away and um, he was, he became a prisoner in the Vatican, you know, and so on. So those time frames are pretty, pretty important because uh, that was the period of time in which the saints were going to be worn out and persecuted by this, by this religious power that was, uh, had sovereignty over, you know, uh, nations and people and tongues and so on, the whole world, so to speak, or the known world of that time that uh, the saints were going to be uh, uh, really, really affected by the, the imposition of this power that was, uh, uh, you know, pretty well spread throughout what we would say the Holy Roman Empire, all of Central and Northern Europe at the time. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get into that. Napoleon, that's one of my biggest sections, is what happened to Napoleon. It's a very fascinating period of time. All right. Um, the conclusion of the sea beast. I'm finally going to get to the end of him here. All right. Uh, it says in Revelations 13, 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. So all of a sudden, this is in there. And remember, this is Jesus' revelation to John. Jesus is telling us, listen to what I'm telling you. Do you have an ear to hear? Um, if, we, if we don't, read the book, if we don't ever make any attempt to understand it, we don't have an ear to hear. And he's trying to tell you, you need to understand these things, at least try to the best you can so that you can identify this system and not be a part of it. And that is injected right in there. Do you have an ear to hear this? Um, and then in 1310, he, the beast that leads into captivity, shall go into captivity. So he, he's coming into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. 
here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, it's going to come to an end. Have patience, but it's not going to be easy. And this is encouragement to the saints who would have to live through the 1260 days. Um, and once you once you come connected to it and realize it's not just so-called Christians, but people that believe in Jesus, but the brothers and sisters in Christ that this is referring to, it should become, you should become connected to it because you will have an opportunity to speak with them in the kingdom age and talk with them and share their experiences and the things that you studied and read about. And they lived through that time. Hey, Roger, real yes. quick. So the 1260 days, what does that get added to? What date do you add that to to get to Napoleon? I think it was the... Um, uh, the guy 29 to 33, the Justinian decree. Yeah, the decree of Justinian. And secondarily, the uh, decree of focus in six, 608 to 610, or 610 would be the uh, 1260. They added to that would be 1870 when uh, the temporal power of the Pope was uh, eliminated and he was forced to be a, become a prisoner in Vatican City. There, there's several 1260 periods, like from this point to this yeah. point, 60 years this happened. And then there was another thing. If you just go 12, 60 years, another critical thing happened. Well, I would say the primary, uh, the, the primary time frame would be uh, at the time of Justinian, because that's when this, this sea beast uh, came into power. And Justinian was the emperor in the East that gave him his power and, and throne and authority and, and uh, allowed him to, you know, or I guess initiated the 1260 years in which the, uh, sea beast, which was the papacy in Rome, exercised its uh, extreme power over the peoples of, of Europe for 1260 years until Napoleon put a stop to it. I was just going to say, if next week we could have like the three timelines where they where they start and end. Yeah, I have. I had a couple of slides a couple months back that showed all these stair step periods. I'll, I'll, it's in okay. one of my previous classes. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll bring it back. That'd be cool. Thank you. Uh, right. You might remind me the day before so I can go back and find I gotta find where it was. All right. So uh, is the time was the development of the papal organization in a nutshell. Next week we get into this lovable, publicable, adorable, extremely frightening lamp. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beast of the earth that spoke and it was said uh, it um it had two horns like a lamb but spoke like a dragon which is quite a contrast in things uh, what all that means so uh we'll pick up with the beast of the earth next week i thought we'd get that far but it's probably just as well we did if there's that much to talk about so thank you roger any questions just ask Gerald or David. Or... You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Yeah, it's coming along very nicely. Oh, sorry. Who did you want to conclude? Oh, oh, we wanted to. Oh, yeah, we wanted to. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Walter, can you close for us? Sure. Are you kind and most merciful Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that it is in you that we live and move and have our being. To the dust we, were, we would return. By the great power we'd be scattered to the four corners of the earth. If it was not for thy love for us, thy great truth would you have revealed to us. Certainly, thy mercy and grace. So we thank you for this word that enlightens us and helps us to understand the plan that you've set forth. <laughs> we pray to use these words have been given unto us, prepare our hearts and minds as we ready for that day that we feel is so soon. My son shall return and set us the kingdom here upon the face of the earth. May we be made ready, prepared, and heart and mind for it. Give those who are not as blessed as we are this evening to have had this understanding and continue to understand that they may be guided and directed, and that all we may touch, we may help them to come to understand that word. For you bless us so that we may be a blessing to others. May that be so each and every day. 
We thank you now for this blessing and an opportunity through the name of thy son, Jesus, to pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your efforts. Thank good. you. Good night. Good thank night, you. Everybody. Good night. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Walter. Hello.